Hi, welcome. Welcome to Botany for Beginners with Caprice Disbro with the Laguna Foundation and Ag and Open Space. Thank you for joining us today. It, for those of you that have come to our community education programs in the past, you know we love to hear who's out in our audience. So please feel free to pull up the chat box, which you can find by hovering your cursor over your Zoom screen. You can pull up that little chat button and let us know where you're tuning in from today and who's out there in our audience. We would love to say hello. You can select who you're chatting with with that little drop down. It'll say two, and then you can say all panelists or all panelists and attendees if you want everyone to see your comment. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, everybody. If you're just joining us, please feel free to drop your name and where you're tuning in from today in the chat box so we know who's out there in our audience. We are going to start right at noon, but we'll wait for some more folks to join us. Welcome to Botany for Beginners with the Laguna Foundation and Ag and Open Space. Nice to see you here. I, this is the topic of the season. I don't know about for you all. I'm sure we've got a lot of wildflower enthusiasts out there. I know I went on a walk this morning in a park nearby my house just to see what's blooming. It seems like there's more and more flowers out there every day. So I am looking forward to this presentation to learning a little bit more about what I'm seeing and I hope that it's the same for all of you. If you've just joined us, feel free to drop your name and where you're tuning in from today in the chat box. Thank you all for joining us. We've got folks from all around the Bay Area, from all around Sonoma County, Katati, Sebastopol, Healdsburg. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Got it. folks from Southern California, Pennsylvania. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome all. I'm going to go ahead and get started. And as folks are joining us, we'd love to hear where you are tuning in from today and your name, you can feel free to drop that in the chat box as I go along giving some introductions before I hand it over to Caprice to get started. So hello everybody, thank you for being here today. My name is Allison Titus and I am the Community Education Manager here at the Laguna Foundation. I'd like to begin this program, this celebration of our open space with a land acknowledgement. A land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects indigenous people as traditional stewards of this land and rec recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous people and the, and the land. The Laguna de Santa Rosa sits within the homeland of the Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo people to raise awareness for ancestral and current indigenous people's presence in the Laguna watershed, we pay our respect to the past, present, and future generations of Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo people and their Wapo neighbors. This feels important to share before talking about our work caring for the Laguna. And if you'd like to know more about the indigenous land you live on, you can visit nativeland.ca. I'm going to go ahead and drop a link to that in the chat. It's a great resource so you can find out more about the traditional homeland you live on as well. There's that link for you all. Okay, so a little more about the Laguna Foundation. We are a nonprofit organization based in Santa Rosa that works to restore, conserve, and inspire public appreciation for the Laguna de Santa Rosa wetlands. The Laguna is a wetland, as you can see in this top right photo here, and a 22 mile long waterway, as well as an entire watershed that encompasses Santa Rosa, Katati, Rohnert Park, and parts of Sevastopol and Windsor. These wetlands have been heavily impacted by development in the Santa Rosa Plain, and they now face important issues that drive our restoration, conservation, and education work today. However, 
That's not the whole story of the Laguna. Despite those challenges, the Laguna is a biodiversity hotspot. It is home to endangered plants and animals, some of which we will be talking about today. And it has the very special designation of being a wetland of international importance. It's one of only 34 sites in the US with this honor. And we restore these wetlands by completing conservation science projects, planting native trees, shrubs, and forbs, managing invasive species, and increasing public knowledge and appreciation through our school programs and community programs like this webinar today. And we do this important work of conserving this watershed, working to restore wetland habitat, and educating future generations with the support and partnership of organizations like Ag and Open Space, so that the Laguna is a place for all to enjoy and protect for years to come. We host outings on, learn about, and explore the open space that Ag and Open Space has preserved and protected with conservation easements. And they've protected over 122,000 acres in Sonoma County to date this way. This open space helps us be more resilient to extreme weather events and climate change, and the many grasslands, forest, and wetland ecosystems within those 122,000 acres store and sequester vast amounts of carbon. So this presentation and many more of our outings on the land are made possible with your public support of ag and open space and conservation in Sonoma County. Caprice will be giving an introduction to the vast and complex world of botany today and interspersed throughout her presentation, she will be sharing examples of wildflower species on ag and open space protected land within the Laguna watershed. Some of these sites like Taylor Mountain pictured here are places you can explore this spring and practice your botany skills on your own. And then there's other sites like Saddle Mountain that are only open on guided outings through Ag and Open Space partners. So they are closed to the public to protect those special resources, but you can access them through outings um, that Ag and Open Space sponsors, which you can find on their website. But those are great opportunities to learn more about botany too. So and with all of that, these are just some of the many places, be, you know, in Sonoma County that you can explore. There are so many botanical hotspots beyond the Laguna watershed. We are so fortunate to have so many habitats and ecosystems that you can explore in Sonoma County. So I encourage you to check out some of the resources that we will send you in the follow-up email to learn about where else you can explore as well. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Caprice Disbro. This is her second time with us as a speaker on beginning botany. She was one of our very first Zoom presentations just about a year ago. Caprice is a professional botanist and instructor of botany at Santa Rosa Junior College and Napa Valley College. She holds a bachelor's degree in plant biology from UC Davis and her master's degree is in biology from Sonoma State. Caprice is passionate about the diversity and evolution of California native plants, and she serves on the board of the California Native Plant Society Milo Baker chapter, where she edits the newsletter, serves on the scholarship committee, and helps with education, outreach, and communications. Caprice, it's so fun to work with you and have you back again, and I will hand it over to you to get started. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, uh, Allison. It's so fun giving presentations like this. And thank you all of you for coming here today. I'm really excited to share with you a little bit of the language of botany. This is for beginners, but we're going to cover some of the names of structures and anatomical features that we see in flowers. So I want to start by asking you to think of a flower that has intrigued you. This can be your favorite flower, or this could be a flower that stumped you, that caught your eye. What was it about that flower that you loved? 
can you put names to those structures? Can you describe that flower to a friend or fellow naturalist or botanist? For example, in this flower here, there's some beautiful patterning on this structure. Could you describe that to a friend? You might be thinking, Caprice, we know what petals are, but is this a petal or is it a sepal? Or do botanists call it something else entirely? And what's this thing in the middle? For this plant you're thinking of, how did you learn its name? If you're new to botany, maybe you asked someone. Maybe you posted it to iNaturalist and got some comments. I'll tell you the name of this flower. This is the checker lily, Fritillaria affinis, that you can find on Hood Mountain in the Laguna watershed, um, possibly flowering right now. Okay, so you've learned the name of your plant, but now what? Why learn about anatomy? Well, as I mentioned, this will help you to be able to talk and write about that plant, to be able to describe it to a friend. But what's even more powerful is as you learn the terms, the names of these structures, it can help you recognize patterns of these features and structures in different lineages of plants. And that can help you be able to identify plants for yourself. Anyone can do that with some resources like a dichotomous key and some practice. You can identify and figure out the name of that plant for yourself. The practice that comes into play is learning some of that anatomy and the terms that we use to describe these plants. So the purpose of this talk is to help provide some practical help, some practical skills for those of us who are hoping to learn or starting to learn how to identify plants. But another purpose is just to have fun and look at some of the amazing diversity that we have even just here in the Laguna de Santa Rosa watershed. So here's the outline for my talk today. I'll start with floral anatomy, parts of a flower, variations of flower, and I'll describe something called insertion. And then we'll look, we'll take a closer look at the female parts, the male parts, the calyx and the corolla. And all throughout this talk, as Allison mentioned, I will show examples of Sonoma County native flowers found on ag and open space protected lands within the Laguna watershed. And so we have a poll for you guys. Allison's gonna pull that up. Yes, so we are curious about which ag and open space lands listed here you have visited within the Laguna de Santa Rosa watershed. And you may select all of the options that apply to you for those of you that spend a lot of time exploring around the county. For those of you who are tuning in from outside Sonoma County, you know, I, we didn't put a none option. So <laughs> note this if you ever get to visit or come out, um, you know, these are some great places to visit. So we'll give you um, just a minute here to put your votes in and we'll see where people like to explore. This is exactly as we predicted. Taylor Mountain and the Laguna Trail are so far trending at the top. We'll share the results when we're done. We'll just give it another five, 10 seconds. 55% of you who have voted. Thanks so much for participating. All right, we'll just do another 10 seconds and then I'll close it out and share the results. Maybe some of you are trying to think of what would come in third or fourth. 
All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share those results. So, woo, Laguna Trail. <laughs> Yes, it's, it makes a lot of sense that the Laguna Trail would be the most visited. In my opinion, it's a very accessible trail, centrally located in the county. It's pretty flat. Um, I know I've been there the most, but I'm biased, obviously. But the other funny thing is this one I've been to the second most personally is also Taylor Mountain. Again, centrally located. Um, and it's beautiful, beautiful views. So. Anything to and add, Caprice? That Saddle Mountain is the least visited, as Allison, you mentioned, uh, limited access there. Exactly. Yeah, great. Thanks for participating. Okay. So let's start with floral anatomy. Start with floral anatomy. We'll start with parts of the flower. And so, of course, I've got to start with this typical flower, the diagram of a typical flower. We're starting from the beginning. In a typical flower, at the base of the flower, we call it the receptacle. And above the receptacle, we have four layers of structures. We call that those worlds. We have four worlds, four layers of parts. And the first world are the sepals. Often green, these are what were protecting the flower when it was a bud. When we talk about all the sepals collectively, we call it the calyx. Next in line, next up, in next layer in the flower are the petals. Petals can be showy. We'll look at some diversity of petals. But when we talk about all of the petals together, we'll call it the corolla. The petals and the sepals are sterile. They don't have reproductive parts, but they're part of the flower nonetheless. And when we talk about both the petals and the sepals together, we have a name for that, the perianth. So let's move on to the reproductive parts. Next in line are the male parts, the stamens. We have filament and an anther. The filament is a stalk, the anther is what contains the pollen. When we talk about all the stamens together, you'll see the term andresium. And then lastly, in the center of the flower, we have the female structure. We have a pistil with a style, I'm sorry, a stigma where pollen is received, a style, and an ovary. Inside the ovary are ovules. Those are what become seeds. When we talk about the female structure collectively, you'll see the word pistil, you'll also see the term carpal. And I'll address that later in the talk. But when we talk about these parts collectively, we'll say gynecium. So this is just a, one example of a flower, a typical flower with all four parts, sepals, petals, stamens, and pistils but there's more variations to flowers. The flowers we just looked at have both male and female parts together on the same flower. We call a plant that has that type of flower cynoecious. But that's not always the case. We can have plants that have on the same individual only male flowers or only female flowers too. We call this monaceous. And we can have another situation where of the same species, one individual plant has just female flowers and another individual has just the male flowers. We call that dioecious. So I'll show you some examples of each of these variations of flowers. And we have a couple more terms to further describe these variations of flowers. If we're talking about monoecious or dioecious, we can further describe these flowers as complete or incomplete. 
Complete flowers have all four of those layers of the whorls, sepals, petals, stamens, and pistils. So any flower that's lacking any one of those layers, one or more of those parts is incomplete. And so we have a really nice example here of Coriolis cornuta. This is our California hazelnut or beaked hazelnut. Here, what you're seeing is the female flower, the pistillate flower. And then here, what you're seeing is a cluster of male flowers, of staminate flowers. And these are on the same plant. So this is Monetius. You can see Coriolis cornuta at our North Sonoma Mountain protected lands, ag and open space land. So this is complete versus incomplete. Another way that we can describe flowers are as perfect and yes, imperfect. No flower is imperfect. However, botanically speaking, we do have perfect and imperfect flowers. This is important to note if you're trying to identify um, or just observe your flowers further. Did you know that poison oak, Toxicodendron diversilobum, has staminate flowers and pistillate flowers, but they have only male flowers and only female flowers. Because this flower is lacking one of the other reproductive parts, the male parts in this case, this is an imperfect flower. And in this case, this one's lacking the female part, so it's imperfect. And furthermore, did you know that poison oak is dioecious? Some individuals, some individual plants of poison oak will only have female flowers, clusters of female flowers. And some separate individuals will only have male flowers. Did you know that? Here we're seeing in this picture, clusters of male only flowers. All of the flowers here have just those stamens. We see a filament and an anther, filament and an anther in all of these flowers. This was observed at North Sonoma Mountain. Another classic example of a dioecious species, therefore it has imperfect and incomplete flowers, is coyote brush. Coyote brush or Bacchus pilularis, some individual shrubs will have our female flowers and some will have our male flowers. Something I wanna mention while we're on the slide is that what we're seeing here are actually clusters of flowers. We're actually seeing an inflorescence here. And in my talk today, I'm not really, I'm not going to cover inflorescences. And although I'd love to, um, and I'm, and so I'm not really going to get into the anatomy of Asteraceae flowers. What we're seeing here are Aster, Asteraceae sunflower family flowers. So unfortunately I won't be getting into that anatomy. That would be a whole nother fun talk. And similarly, I wanna mention that in our talk today, I won't be going into the anatomy of grass flowers. That would be a whole nother fun talk to do. So I've mentioned North Sonoma Mountain a couple times and here is that classic, their beautiful photo of view from North Sonoma Mountain that I have um, in my, at the very beginning of my talk and that Allison showed as well. Okay, so the next topic I wanna talk about are some botanical terms, some anatomy of flowers called insertion, insertion of flower parts. I have a lot on this slide, but let me break it down for you. Some flowers have their floral parts, sepals, petals, stamens, inserted or attached below the female part. And we call this hypogynous, hypo for below, Gynus for female part, hypogynous. And so what we're seeing is a superior ovary. 
not that it's superior because it's amazing or the best, but because it's above that point of attachment. Another way we can see a flower arranged, another way we can see floral parts inserted or attached is in a perigenous flower where the attachment is around, peri meaning around the female part. And in this case, we see a hypanthium, a floral cup surrounding the gynecium. Now there are more variations to perigenous flowers and hypanthiums. You can see more variation here, but for the case of this talk, I wanna just show you these three examples. Uh, and we can also have an epigenous, epi for above. The floral parts are attached above the ovary of the flower. And we often call this an inferior ovary. So here are some really nice examples. For a superior ovary, here we're looking at Arbutus menziesii. We see the attachment of the corolla, the petals here, and the stamens below the uh, superior ovary here. So this is hypogenous. In this flower, prunus, which isn't a native, but I, I'll show you a native in just a second. We see our, our female part down here. And then we have this floral cup and the petals and stamens are attached here and, uh, and then attached to this floral cup, the hypanthium. Here is a native ex example in Heteromeles arbutifolia, toyon or Christmas berry, where you can see that these petals and stamens are attached to the rim of this hypanthium, this floral cup here. And although you can't see it, the female part is in the center there. And a nice example of an inferior ovary is in blue-eyed grass, Cicerichia bellum, Cicerichium bellum. And so we've got our floral parts and the ovary is actually inside of this, this kind of protected sheath here. Okay, so we've learned some new terms about the ovary, where the ovary is in in candy and flowers. Think back. Earlier in this talk, I had you think of a flower that intrigued you. Right now, I want you to think of your favorite flower, a flower you know really well. Where does the ovary sit? Do you know? So we have a second poll for you guys. Where does uh, the ovary sit? in your favorite flower? Let us know. And it's okay if you don't know. That is totally okay. Maybe you're Googling it right now. <laughs> And remember, maybe your flower looks different than these. There are more intermediate cases and variations to flowers, of course. Excellent. We've got about 67, 70% of us voted. I'll give it just a couple more seconds. Excellent. So most of us have no idea that's okay. I hope you're excited to investigate. The next time you have your favorite flower on hand, if there are, it's not a rare plant, if you're on that hike and there are lots of them around, then you can ethically take one of those flowers and maybe cut into it or examine it. Maybe you pick it to cut into it. Maybe you just look at it while it's on the plant still and see if you can describe where that ovary sits. This can be really important for identifying plants if you wanted to use a key to identify it. In general, superior ovaries are found in our more primitive and early angiosperms. 
and inferior ovaries are found in our more advanced and derived angiosperm flowers or more recently evolved flowers. So this can tell us a lot about the tree of life and evolution of this amazing group of plants. So next up is the section I'm calling a closer look at. Let's take a closer look at the female parts, the gynecium, the male parts, the andresium, the calyx, and the corolla. I want to start with the gynecium because as I alluded to earlier, there's a few terms that um, can get, can be confusing. And that was that pistol carpal thing. Many botanists uh, have to circle back on this topic. And so I want to attempt to give you a little bit of an introduction here. When we look at a, a carpal or a pistil, what, what we're seeing here in this example is a single carpal, a single kind of cavity inside of this ovary with our style and our stigma. And so we call this a simple pistil. This is compared to, or this is different than a compound pistil where we have fused carpals. We have multiple carpals fused together. And so the carpal has to do with kind of the chambers and fusion and the pistil is talking, is kind of um, referring to the structure as a whole, kind of like the gynecium. So we can have a single unfused carpal that we'd call a simple pistil. We can also find multiple unfused carpals and each of those are a simple pistil. This is something that we see in very early angiosperms or most, some of our most ancient flowers. And I'll show you an example of this next. But something that we see very commonly in the angiosperms are fused carpals. And when we see multiple styles and stigmas or lobing in our stigma, that can give us a clue to how many carpals are fused together there. And can, we can also examine this by taking a cross section of the simple or compound pistil and looking at the chambers inside. Now, there's a lot of diversity here. Where those ovules sit in your, ov in your um, ovary is called placentation, where they attach to a placenta. And so again, next time you see your flower, your uh, favorite flower, and it's ethical to, to examine it closer, maybe take a razor blade and try to cut a cross section and examine your pistil and see how many fused carpels might be within it and where those ovules sit. So I'm gonna start by showing you an example of multiple unfused carpels, a more primitive trait. And then I will have numerous examples of fused carpels and compound pistils. One beautiful example of multiple unfused carpels are, are in ranunculus. And we have a couple species, one of which Ranunculus californicus, the common buttercup here, with multiple unfused carpels. It's hard to tell that they're unfused in this image, but there they are, multiple little style and stigmas here, surrounded by many stamens. These are the male structures. Look how beautifully yellow these are, many parts. When we see lots of parts as well, many of these rather than just six, that's also a more ancient and more primitive trait in angiosperm flowers. And so when we have multiple unfused carpels, we call it uh, apocarpus. A fabulous place to find ranunculus is at Tomodashi Park in Sebastopol. In this image here, we can see ranunculus throughout this grassland. We have a beautiful oak woodland. And at this park 
and nearby at the Laguna Trail and the city of Santa Rosa Farms, we have an extremely rare habitat type called a vernal pool. And I'll show you some vernal pool um, species later. And um, I'm ex I just, I've, it's such a wonderful habitat type that um, we're gonna talk about more in this, in this talk just a little bit. So the, that was multiple unfused carpals. Now let's take a look at one example of fused carpals into a compound pistil. Here we're looking at Clarkia purpurea, the wine cup Clarkia, that you can find on Taylor Mountain. In this flower, there's a few things I want to point out to you. The first is this stigma. It's hard to tell, but it's actually four lobed. This fourth lobe is kind of pointing at us. And look at how beautiful the stigma is, the color, that kind of hairiness to it. But because we see those four lobes, I can predict that there are likely four chambers and four fused carpels in this compound pistil. And indeed, when we see this flower make a fruit, if we took a cross section of that ovary, we would see that there are four chambers. When we have fusion of carpels, we can call it syncarpus. And as you're identifying a flower, you might come across this term. And notice too in this flower, here we have a senescing flower. Senescing means aging, dying at the end of its time. And below it, we have this. This, my friends, is a lovely example of an inferior ovary, an epigenous flower. The floral parts are inserted or attached above epi above the ovary. This is very common in Angraceae, this family that um, these flowers are found in. Next, we're going to look at the male parts. And while we're here, oh my gosh, look at these male parts on this wine, club car this wine cup Clarkia. White anthers with very light and white translucent pollen too. There's even some pollen on the stigma. That is beautiful. These are really lovely, a lovely part of this flower. But as you can guess, there's a lot more variation in the male parts too. So next, I want to show you mm, a flower that I, will never forget when I first looked more closely at it. How many times have you walked by a bay tree? A California bay, Umbellularia californica. How many times have you noticed those yellow, green, creamy flowers in little clusters? not very showy and kind of small. Have you ever looked this closely at an Umbellularia californica flower? Look at this crazy structure. Let me break it down for you. We're seeing a couple things. First off, we're seeing nine sepals. One, two, three, four, not shown here, five, six, seven, eight, nine, six in the center, three around here, or six around the outside and three in the center. The female part's right here in the middle. And there are also these bright orange glands associated with the andresium, with these male parts. No, I don't know what the glands are. If you guys know, please email me after this. I would love to know more about these glands. But Look at these male parts. It looks like a paw print. What we're seeing are four chambers with these valve-like lids that peel up to open up the chambers where pollen was held. 
And so what we're seeing is this little paw shape and this one with the valves peeled up almost looks like a little cat paw with the nails kind of sticking out maybe. Isn't that so beautiful? So this is an umbellularia californica flower. Something else I want to notice or want to mention as well is that in this flower, we don't have petals. What you're seeing are sepals in this case. So is it complete or incomplete? Another fun variation or another neat structure you might see when investigating the endrisium, the male parts of a flower, is what's called monadelphus, one brother. Here we see the filaments of the stamens fused around the style of the pistil. And so we see all of the anthers kind of at this level here, and we see a kind of a tube or a funnel leading up, and then the style and stigma protruding out from the center of that. This is very common in Malvaceae. So think of a hibiscus flower, for example. But here we have at Taylor Mountain, Sedalcia malviflora. Oh, I'm sorry, this should be italicized, my apologies. And so here you can see those stamens um, fused together. This is a monadelphus example. And back to the gynecium, look at this beautiful stigma beautiful color and branched in a really beautiful way. A little bit more on stamens, on stamen arrangement. What we've looked at are some unique stamens and some fusion of stamens here. But I wanna show you another neat arrangement. In mustards, in Brassicaceae, we have a very unique arrangement. We have something called tetradynamous stamens. We have two sets, four long and two short. And in this picture of milkmaids that you can see at Taylor Mountain, these may no longer be in flowering. Most of the flowers I'm showing are flowering right around now, but these are really early to flower. These may be uh, on their way out and senesced, aged at this point, the petals might be falling off, the fruits might be forming. But in this image over here is where you can see that tetradynamous arrangement. Four long, one, two, three, four, and two short, one, two. In this flower over here, we can see one of the short ones tucked down here and some of the long ones out here. So brassicas, like the yellow mustard flowers that we see all over the county right now, will have tetradynamous stamens. If you have a raised bed or a garden at home and you're growing kale, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, kohlrabi, cauliflower. Those are all brassicas too. And if they go to flower, if you look closely, you'll see a flower similar to this, but likely yellow, tetradynamous stamens. Something else about brassica flowers is this cruciform shape, four petals in the shape of a cross. Classic brassicaceae. Another arrangement of stamens you might notice in some plants like Lamiaceae or mints, also Scrofulariaceae, is a didynamis. Two sets, too long and too short of stamens. And in this white hedge nettle that you can find at Hood Mountain, it's a little hard to tell, but we've got too long and too short. The long ones are kind of curved out front and the short ones are in back here. So if you were to get into this flower a little bit more deeply, you'd see four stamens, two long and two short. And I know we're not talking about pollinators today, 
But look at this brilliant setup. A pollinator comes and those four different length stamens dust the back of that insect with pollen. Just a genius mechanism right here. So I've mentioned Hood Mountain a couple times. Hood Mountain is a beautiful place to go. And in this picture even, you can see multiple habitats. We're seeing grassland and oak woodland. And behind we're seeing a mixed evergreen forest, or mixed coniferous. This looks like a madrone to me. This might be a um, uh, uh, Douglas fir. So in this picture alone, you could imagine that you could see quite a variety of flowering plants. So I have another slide on the male parts. And I couldn't make a talk without showing you some of the amazing colors of stamens as well. And I'll also talk about another arrangement thing here too. But bird's eye gilia, a beautiful flower you can find, for example, at Hood Mountain that has blue stamens, kind of at the tip there. Blue stamens, isn't that incredible? There are flowers that have uh, different colored pollen as well, but here we're looking at the male part, blue stamens. In soap plant, a, a, an incredible plant with um, wavy leaves, a bulb, a geophyte, flowers later in the summer. This one is not flowering right now. But chlorogallum have these really small flowers. You might not have ever looked at them that closely. Beautiful small flowers. And they have golden anthers on their stamens. And in part of their development, they can also look red. But when they're mature, they're golden. Something else I want to point out here is that in Gilia, the stamens attach between the petals. Whereas in soap plant, they attach right with the petal, right? Kind of parallel or aligned with the petal. It's not very easy to see here, but they're not between petals, they're with the petal. And look at that, superior or inferior ovary. Okay, we've looked at the gynecium. We've looked at some more neat and beautiful examples of the andresium. Now let's look at some examples of sepals and the calyx. So when we talk about sepals collectively, it's the calyx and they're typically green and they protect and enclose the petals and the developing flower. But there are all kinds of modifications. And honestly, this might be one of the most underlooked parts of a plant, underexamined, one of the parts that um, aren't necessarily showy, showy, but show have a lot of diversity and can play a big role as we're beginning to recognize patterns in plant lineages. So one I want to show you is Ansinchia intermedia, the common fiddle neck. I already mentioned, I'm not talking about inflorescences, but what a cool cluster of flowers. Maybe that will be another talk. But what I wanna show you are the sepals. They are bristly and fused. We're seeing some fusion with some lobes and bristles on these. In fact, much of this plant has these little bristles, but the sepals do too. You can find Ansinki at Taylor Mountain, and I'll even show you a picture of that in a second. Another neat case for sepals are in the California poppy, Escholtia californica. Have you ever noticed when you look at a poppy plant, a poppy flower, a California poppy flower, it looks, it looks kind of simple or it looks really clean, maybe you would say. Maybe you were trying to describe the fact that it didn't have any sepals. And that's because 
they are shed as that flower starts to emerge, starts to open. The, this is a nice example of a deciduous or um, sepals that fall off as the flower develops. And here we're seeing the, the sepals fall off as this flower is about to open. Of course, you can find a Schultzia throughout the Laguna watershed and through much of, of California. So here's a look at Taylor Mountain. Um, Allison showed you this picture. We're, we're looking at Taylor Mountain in Santa Rosa, a great place to get a little workout and hike right up that mountain. And here's a view from Taylor Mountain. We can see um, uh, uh, Mount St. Helena over here and Amsinkia here in the foreground. Okay, gynesium, andresium, sepals. Remember in the beginning of this talk when I kind of teased about that fritillary flower and those structures, we have a term for when the perianth, the sepals and the petals look indistinguishable. We call those structures tepals to indicate not just that we're talking about the perianth as a whole, but that the sepals and petals look very similar. And in this lily and others rel uh, that are related to this lily, that is often the case. And in fact, you can see here that this petal and this petal are slightly in front of this one. It's kind of hard to tell, but this one here is actually attached outside of these two. That's one way to indicate those different layers or whorls of floral parts. And so this sepal looks just like this petal. So we call them tepals. Now that we're looking at the perianth, we're looking at petals and sepals, we can also describe flowers by their symmetry. Some flowers have radial symmetry. We call that actinomorphic. If you were to cut a slice through this flower, we'd have multiple planes where we'd see mirror images. My favorite, Calicanthus occidentalis, a beautiful shrub, is um, an example of a, a flower with tepals. We have lots of these structures that are indistinguishable from each other, sepals and petals, we call those tepals. You can find both of these plants at Hood Mountain. Something else I wanna note here is that what we're seeing, if you were to separate these structures and separate these structures, that they're free. When we describe sepals and petals and the prairie ant, something we also look for is fusion of parts here. And when we see free parts, parts that are not fused to other parts, that can indicate a more ancient or earlier evolved plant. Free parts are typically, but not always, indicative of a more ancient plant. Same with many parts. Remember I mentioned that in ranunculus with all of those stamens. Here we see many, many tepals indicating this is a more primitive type of flower. So these are nice examples of actinomorphic radial symmetry. Let's look at another type of symmetry in the corolla, bilateral symmetry. We call that zygomorphic. So in these two flowers here, we're seeing bilateral symmetry, just one plane that you can draw, one line you can draw to have a mirror image. Something else that we see in these flowers are fused parts, fused petals into a tube. That can be indicative both zygomorphic symmetry and fusion of floral parts can be indicative of more derived and more advanced flowers in the tree of life of 
of angiosperm flowers. So here we have a really neat species, Penstemon nuberii sonomensis. We've got a few Penstemon nuberii in the region, but they're all a little bit more fuchsia, slightly different than this one. This species, this subspecies, Somanensis, is a little bit more red, and it's actually quite rare. It's a little bit more rare. CMPS 1B.3. And so 1B.3, 1B means plants are rare, threatened, or endangered in California or elsewhere. And the 0.3 is me, means not very threatened, which is a little vague. To quantify that, it means less than 20% of occurrences are threatened. So still pretty rare, but not extremely threatened at this time. You can find this at Hood Mountain, our very own ag and open space protected land within the Laguna watershed. Beautiful example of uh, Didynamis stamens, two sets with two different lengths, too long, too short, fusion of floral parts, bilateral symmetry. Really cool. Another really amazing flower is the moon spot calico flower down Ningia concolor. Look at this cutie. Another nice example of bilateral symmetry. This is a flower found in vernal pools. You can find this in May. This one's not flowering just yet. This one will flower more in May as those vernal pools start to slowly dry up and we get these concentric rings of species that have adapted to that, that environment. Downingia can be found at the city of Santa Rosa Farms uh, Laguna Trail. And it's such a cute flower. So here's a picture of City of Santa Rosa Farms. We've got valley oaks and we've got these um, relatively flat grasslands, wetlands, and vernal pools here. And we're curious, how many of you have ever visited a vernal pool? Allison's gonna pull up another poll for you guys. Okay, the polling is live. Have you ever visited a vernal pool? Maybe you don't know if you have or not. Maybe you've been somewhere you think you might have seen one, but you're not sure. Awesome. Thanks everyone for voting. This is a quick one. Let's let it go for another 10 seconds. Great. All right, I think we've got most folks in. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling and share the results, which makes sense. I love that, of course, there's no one out there who's just not interested <laughs> in this habitat type, which makes sense because it's very interesting. A lot of folks have visited vernal pools, which is great. Um, they're scattered throughout Sonoma County. Some say not yet, and then a few more than that say they don't know, which I really think is a very valid answer. I think prior to moving to Sonoma County, I personally probably saw a vernal pool, but I didn't know that I had seen one. Um, and we, I'm glad to hear that there's so much interest in vernal pools. We will be having another event on April 8th, specifically just all about vernal pools. It will be another webinar like this one where we'll really dive into um, the unique biology of those particular habitats here on the Santa Rosa Plain. All right, I'll go ahead and stop sharing those. Thanks everyone. So remember, here at City of Santa Rosa Farms Laguna Trail, you can see, you can access uh, some vernal pools and also at Tomodachi Park in Spastapool. Tomodachi is a great place because it's a pretty small park and the, the vernal pools are really apparent. So I encourage you to take a look at those a few times over the spring because they change. Beautiful, really cool habitat. Okay, so we have just a little bit more about the corolla. 
I want to show you this really neat example. This is the Pacific Madrone or Butis menziesii, a flowering tree. You can see this at North Sonoma Mountain and a few other places around the county. I want to show you a couple things. First, notice the fused corolla. We have a lot of fusion of our petals into this kind of tube and bell shaped structure. And something that you can maybe see is that we have, we actually have some lobing in these fused petals. So you can actually see that these consisted of one, two, three, four, five petals that were fused together. If you look closely, you can see that these lobes are kind of curled back. So whenever you see fusion of petals, you can sometimes still figure out the number of petals that were fused and that can help you figure out the family or the group of plants. Something else that's really cool in Pacific Madrone flowers. Again, how many times have you walked by a Pacific Madrone? You know, that beautiful slick bark with the peely parts. It's just this beautiful cinnamon red color and those big leaves. How many times have you walked by it and didn't notice that the top or the maybe the bottom, the, the part of this corolla has these little translucent windows what you're seeing are little translucent parts of the corolla that I suspect are a modification to help pollinators. As a pollinator gets up into this corolla, they need a little light to see where they're going and what they're doing, or maybe even to get confused and get more pollen on them. So next time you see a Pacific Madrone and you, have, you can see the flowers, they're low enough that you can grab a couple. Look for these little translucent windows, super cool. Something else I wanna show you and some new terms I want to um, tell you about have to do with whether or not the female or male parts are tucked inside the corolla and petals or kind of protruding beyond them. If you start identifying plants, you'll probably come across the term included or exhausted. Included means they're tucked in. They're not projecting beyond the corolla. And in this flower, in these flowers, the stamens, as you can kind of see them in here and here, are tucked in. They don't protrude beyond the corolla. They're tucked in there. But the stigma and style are exhausted. They are projecting beyond the corolla. So that can be a trait that you might need to look at when you're describing and trying to identify a flower. This is also a great picture because we can see some of these flowers without that beautiful corolla. And here we see the gynecium and that ovary. And what we're seeing is a superior ovary. Even though it's upside down, the petal, the corolla is attached right in there below these sepals. Okay, I have another one more Corolla slide for you guys. I mentioned that radial symmetry is considered more primitive. When we look at the evolution of flowers, radial symmetry is more primitive and bilateral is more advanced. Another aspect in bilateral flowers that indicates an advancement or a, a, a more advanced flower is the modification of petals into a banner, wing, and keel, as we see in Fabaceae. The banner is this big petal at the top. The wings come out from the sides. In this case, they're white. And the keel are another set of petals shown here in this purple in the center that protect the reproductive parts. So in this cross section of this uh, Fabaceae pea flower, we can see the banner, one wing and one keel. So that's some highly specified or specialized petals, corolla. But I also wanna go back to the andresium because what we're seeing here 
is something we haven't seen yet. We're seeing nine fused stamens below and one free stamen above. This is diadelphus, two brother, two brothers. And this is a common andrisium arrangement that you see in, in Fabiaceae. The pistil is in there, we can't really see it very well. And you guys, here in Sonoma County, also found in Napa, but here in Sonoma County is a rare species of a Fabaceae flower called Clara Hunt's milk vetch. This is a beautiful flower that you can, that is found at Saddle Mountain. That's that protected land that um, has limited access. You'd have to go with Ag and Open Space or Laguna if, if, they, if they led a hike. I think that's more of an Ag and Open Space led hike. So this is a 1B.1 rare plant. And so CMPS 1B.1, we saw 1B before, plants are rare, threatened or endangered in California or elsewhere, but the 0.1 indicates seriously threatened, meaning that greater than 80% of occurrences are threatened for development and habitat modification. So this is one of those beautiful rare flowers that we can find here in the Laguna watershed at Saddle Mountain. Here's Saddle Mountain, a nice view of gold fields, a, a flower, uh, an Asteraceae, Lasthenia californica, that I didn't go into in much detail because it's an aster, a very unique kind of inflorescence. So we have a little bit more time and I planned for that if we had a little extra time. So I wanna take a second to go over just the beginning. I have just a couple slides of plant identification, if you're interested. First, I wanna tell you about what supplies you might wanna start gathering. And I wanna go over an example of a dichotomous key. For supplies, you'll want a flora or your dichotomous key. The Jepson Manual is the key for all of California and the California Floristic Province, so even beyond California. And that can be kind of intimidating to start with. It has a lot of plants in it. I recommend finding a more local flora. This will have a dichotomous key, but your options will be narrowed down to just the plants that are in the area. So this can be much more user-friendly. Something else that's really handy to have is a separate glossary. I love this book here. The Jepson Manual and other floras often have a small glossary, but texts like these help to really break down all of these terms like hypogenous and tetradynamous that maybe you haven't committed to memory and that's okay. There's a lot of botanical terms out there. You'll also need some tools. And I store my tools in a, a hard case sunglass shell. And so you might want a set of forceps, a hand lens, maybe a razor blade, and a ruler. So you can figure out the length of some of these parts that can be important for identification and to see some of the parts that might be really small. It's best if you have a dissecting scope or have access to one. Um, but a hand lens will also often get you where you need to get to be. The last supply that you'll need is patience. Patience, because this is a skill and practice is needed to get better at identifying plants. It's nice to have representative species or to do a little research ahead of time uh, as well to kind of prepare yourself for this, for um, the plant that you're looking at if you know maybe the family of it. And so I just want to explain what a dichotomous key is before we end today. And here's a fun, simple example. Dichotomous for two options. In a dichotomous key, you'll have a couplet. 
two options. And you pick the one that best describes the plant you're looking at, the structures that you're looking at. So if we're using Jolly Rancher candy as our specimen, if we start at this first couplet, chewy or hard, we would select 1B. Because we've select 1B, we'll go to the couplet that is titled seven. The, the couplet, the, this directs us down here. We skip the rest of these that pertain to chewy. And instead, because we selected hard, we'll go down to couplet seven. So at couplet seven, which of the two best describes our specimen? Ball-shaped or not ball-shaped? Right. We're gonna move on to nine. Jolly Ranchers are not ball-shaped. If we skip eight, go to nine, wrapper transparent or wrapper tells the flavor. In our case, Jolly Ranchers indeed tell the flavor that best describes of these two, right? The wrapper is transparent. So sometimes when you're keying out a plant, both will kind of be true, but which one better describes your, your specimen? In this case, the wrapper tells the flavor. You'll see watermelon right there or green apple or whatever. So then you find your species, Joyous Rancheria in this case. So I hope that you are now inspired to take a closer look at the flowers you come across next. And maybe you'll even be able to name and describe some of the structures that you see. Thank you so much for being here. I had a blast giving this talk to you. Yay, round of applause. <laughs> Caprice, thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. There are some questions <clears throat> coming into the chat and we'll, you know, we've got some time. So folks, if you are out there and you have some specific questions that you wanna ask, we can take them now. Um, I will go ahead and chat about some of the ones that came in while you were talking. Also just wanted to say thank you. You know, these botanical terms, if anyone has opened a dichotomous key before or talked to botanists, you know that there are so many terms out there. It's really, really overwhelming. So thank you for breaking it down for us and for giving us some of the language that we can use to start to identify these flowers ourselves. Um, just so you all know, I'll be sending out some resources after this talk, including a recording. So you'll be able to watch this again. I would highly recommend if you've got flowers growing in your yard, like I know I have um, flowers like oxalis growing in my yard um, that I could take and bring in and get out those tools you mentioned, you know, like a razor, um, a hand lens, um, and just check it out. Maybe put this recording on again, put it on just the part about the ovary and see if you can find the ovary on the flower you're looking at. Um, I think this would be a really helpful resource, this recording just for doing that. So that would be my recommendation to you all out there for practice. And then of course, getting out on the land, looking at the flowers in person is super helpful um, as well. I'll also and provide a PDF of this slide set too, as a resource. I'm happy to provide that to you guys. Thank you. That is, that's wonderful. I will do, we'll get that to you all in the, um, in the follow-up email. So thanks for that. Um, and as feel for free the question, to email me as well. I'd be happy to answer questions. Uh, I'd love to connect with any of you. Great. Thank you for that. Okay, so there's a couple questions. The first one is about how how did coyote brush get its name? <laughs> and its common name. I was curious if you know, I looked this up a little. So if you, I don't know if you have any I stories don't. about that. I, I have no idea. If anyone out there wants to chime in in the chat, what did you find from Googling it? So it's funny. I just always assumed that it was called coyote brush because of where it's found. 
because it is common in habitats that also make for great coyote habitat. Um, but what I found is that the origin of the common name coyote brush is unclear, but there's a couple theories, one of which is that the leaves may look like coyote paws, which is adorable. Another is that the plant is really variable and adaptable, um, which is, you know, it's a clever plant, kind of like the coyote. It has adapted like the coyote, which is a really interesting connection to make between those two species. A less, um, this resource says a less imaginative theory suggests it was named because of an ecological association with coyotes, which was my, my theory as well, that these two species share this habitat, hence the name coyote brush. But the origins of common names can be even, they're much more mysterious often than their scientific names, the Latin counterparts. So um, yeah, that was, that's what I learned. So thank you all for bringing that up and <laughs> for teaching me something today. Oh, someone says, I heard that the um, native people saw the fluff from the coyote flowers in the distance and thought they looked like coyotes. Yeah. Also seems super plausible. Beautiful. They look like, yes, the male flowers do look like fur. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another question was about, kind of a while back, was about the checker lily. It has that three-part Mm. Yep. What we're seeing are um, three stigma lobes or even a split. We have split styles. But what I think in the checker lily is a three lobed stigma. It's just very lobed. And there's a lot of terms that can describe the head or the tip of that stigma. But in that case, in that checker lily, what we're seeing is that there was likely three fused carpels in that compound pistil. And something I didn't mention, is the difference between the lineage of monocots and eudicots. And monocots, sets of three, three or six are very common. And so I'm not surprised that we saw six tepals and six stamens and three compound, uh, three carpels in that compound pistol. Great. That's what I was guessing and I guessed correctly. So thank you for clarifying. <laughs> but yeah, it is a really just super deeply lobed divided. Yeah. Stigma. It's very interesting. Um, so we have a couple questions about resources. Okay. Um, First of all, is there somewhere a good place to buy the Sonoma County flora, which is the dichotomous key I would highly recommend using. They, it is a little old, mm -hmm. I think, at this point, but it's still helpful. And you can look up old plant names and it will tell you the current plant name online. So that's not really a huge issue. But um, do you know one, what's a good place to purchase that book? One place I know or one... So uh, the California Native Plant Society Milo Baker chapter, um, we sell it, we used to sell it at our general meetings in person, and now we sell it during our plant sale, but our next plant sale isn't until the fall. So in the meantime, um, I'm not sure if you can purchase it, um, if, in, if any of our board members or any of our members are here um, that know of a place where you can purchase it right now, um, please chime in. Uh, but I know that one place is during our plant sale at the Milo Baker um, chapter plant sale. Yes, that's what I was going to recommend. I will look it up. I have also, I have personally found it challenging outside of CNPS Milo Baker to find that particular book. They do have it at the library though. Um, oh, yeah. That's where I've been able to find it. It's hard, you know, you can't like purchase it from the library, but in the meantime, while you're waiting for the next plant sale, you can borrow the flora from Sonoma County Library. And I will try to find a, another local place where you can buy that book. Um, there are also some, um, the Sonoma County or Bay Area wildflower books that may not have a dichotomous key, but may, may help you find out what your plant is and the family. Um, and although I, I prefer learning the skill of ID, I'm not a purist. It can be really nice to have some of these other 
um, field guides that can help you figure out what your plants are. And there's some amazing ones for our region. Oh, and a free resource online is the Jepson Interchange. This is um, kind of associated with the Jepson manual, that big flora. But this online resource can provide you with descriptions of families, of genus or genera, and individual species. I know I didn't go over classification, but that can be a really great resource for figuring out what it is that you're looking at. Yes, I would also second that. It's a great resource. It's a dichotomous key. It's super helpful. And I will include that in the follow-up email. I frequently find myself using that resource um, as well. But for non-dichotomous, there's also a question about non-dichotomous keys, just kind of any e-guides to local wildflowers. I know that Sonoma County Regional Parks has a good general e-guide to local wildflowers. So I'll include that in the follow-up email, but do you have any other resources you like, Caprice? Um, the, there's that Bay Area wildflower uh, text. I also like California Trees and Shrubs. Um, that's a, a field guide, but that is a, that is a dichotomous key. Um, a really, uh, you know, not off the top of my head, but I'll give you some of, I'll go look at my library and we can provide that in the, um, the follow-up email, some of my more commonly used field guides. Yeah. Had them on hand. It's a good idea. I'll add that in the follow-up. I would also recommend just looking at the statewide, the California Native Plant Society bookstore. They have a lot of great texts that are specific to different regions that are not just really technical. A lot of them are general field guides to specific areas. They might have something that is appropriate for where you live or something more general that you could use um, rather than a dichotomous key. I, Caprice and I both highly recommend iNaturalist <laughs> as an online kind of resource. You can use the explore tool. If you know you're, for example, gonna go on a hike to Taylor Mountain, you can pull up the area on iNaturalist and see what people have seen recently. It is super helpful um for knowing what is out there in the season that you want to explore and getting even an exact pin dropped to the location of that particular flower so that is also something i use frequently and similarly is calflora a website that has occurrence data on plants um, throughout california yes calflora is a really really excellent resource as well Yes, someone vouching for the Bay Area Wildflower Guide. So that seems like a good one. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Okay, so there's, I think there's just one couple more questions and we probably won't have time to answer all of one of them. But the first one is, are the terms eudicot and dicot interchangeable? Ah, great question. So I've been mentioning you know, early angiosperms and more derived angiosperms. And so if we think of all the angiosperms uh, ev evolving over time, we have our early ones and we have our more derived ones. Back in the day, we tried categorizing everything as monocot or dicot. If they had sets of three, if they had one cotyledon, that's a seed leaf, their first kind of leaf, if they had one, it was a monocot. If they had two, it was a dicot. But there were some flowers that had characteristics of both monocots and eudicots, and we didn't know what to do with them. And we learned that those were a group of early angiosperms. We actually call them that, early angiosperms. These include magnolias, ranunculus, or, or not known, um, anyways, we have some early angiosperms. Then we have our monocots, and now we needed a new term for the rest of those plants, eudicot, true dicot. So when we actually think about groups of plants, you might think early angiosperms, monocots, eudicots. Thank you for clarifying that. You're welcome. Helpful. I wish I had a, a diagram for you. Um, maybe I'll, I, I'll grab one for the follow-up. Awesome. 
going to be a great resource, this follow-up email. Mm -hmm. One of the last questions, and I don't know if we'll quite have time to fully cover it, but are there any hacks for memorizing plant parts? Are there any tricks or any like memory devices that you find helpful? Not memory devices. First, I'll say practice helps you become familiar with recognizing. And sometimes we do that, we start recognizing these, these lineages without even realizing, like brassicas. You can identify pretty easily that cruciform shape, even if you didn't know cruciform, and maybe um, kind of just the size and, and arrangement of parts, you just know that's brassica and it's pretty consistent across many of those in that family. But there's a lot of families and a lot of variation one way, one hack can be with floral formulas and floral diagrams that you start to, that you can start to learn and then you can apply that general arrangement of parts to the flowers that you see out there. Um, that would be a whole nother talk, floral diagrams and floral formulas. And it's a little technical, but that's one way if you start practicing those general arrangements, you could start to recognize them. There are others, there are some other things out there too, like a fun one is for Lamiaceae, the mints, they have, they often have square stems. So I didn't talk about vegetative features, but if you feel the stem of mints, they often have square stems and they have two leaves per node that's called opposite. So that's something that's pretty quickly identifiable, whether or not you're familiar with the flower. Um, so you're right, Allison, it's, it would be hard. This would be more of a floristics kind of a thing where we go through different families and the characteristics that we commonly see in those families. I would encourage you to practice and start noting maybe in your field notebook, what families you've come across and some of the big takeaways, what you noticed, um, there it was rarely apparent for that family or for that plant and, um, review your field notes and start making those connections. Yes, great tip. I know there's nothing, it's, it's so complex and there's so much to this topic that there is, there aren't great hacks, but I would also echo just using a field notebook, maybe comparing different species to each other and just starting with one feature that you wanna be able to get down, like one part, you know, I'm going to practice comparing petals. That's it, you know, how many? Where are they located? Or I'm just going to locate the ovary. Is it a superior ovary or an inferior ovary on this plant? Um, and comparing That's often two one of plants. The, one of the early features and a key that really helped to break down whether it's in this whole group of families or this whole group of families, that can be really helpful. Yes, and as you go, you will, like Capri said, you'll start to see patterns, right? You'll be able, instead of having to open a flower up and really look at it, you might start to get a gist of like, okay, I think that flower has a superior ovary based on what I've seen. It's definitely previously. not on a Gracie. It's definitely not a, a Clarkia or a Primrose because it's got a superior one and you'll start to um, put together those patterns, but it takes time. It takes time and it is really helpful in comparison, at least for me, that's it's a, been a really helpful way to learn. Like if I take a plant from my yard, I might have an Oxalis or a California poppy and be able to compare the two, like how do, you know, it, it's helpful, for, especially for things like anthers, looking at them, you know, where they're placed. So you're like, I wonder what they mean by fused. You know, it's hard to tell if you have two flowers right next to each other that are both unfused. Anyway, so I think learning by comparison is super helpful. Um, one quick last question. Do you recommend for your students the Botany in a Day book? Do you know oh, that book? That is a fun one, yes. Um, so I mentioned floral uh, diagrams and floral formulas. Botany in a Day um, isn't California or even West Coast specific. So you'll see species from throughout the US, I believe. But I think that's a fun one. That's a good place to start because um, you'll, you'll be going over some of the big patterns of structures that we see in these different lineages, like orders or families or genera um, of plants. So yeah, Botany in a Day is really fun. And there's also a really fun botany coloring book out there. 
that can be a really fun way to review morphology and anatomy and um, at de-stress maybe while you're out on your hike, sitting in a field. You can Love that idea. Color it while you sketch a plant too. Yes, that sounds like a great mental health <laughs> break doing that. I love that recommendation. Um, and the very last question before we end was, are you going to be leading hikes, teaching hikes where we could do this? And I just wanted to say that the Laguna Foundation is just returning to in-person outings starting in mid-April. So we kind of missed the window to go to Saddle Mountain, to some of these other places to see these rare plants. However, in a regular year, we lead outings all year, interpretive hikes to go see wildflowers. We frequently go visit vernal pools because it's such a special part of the Laguna watershed. And we go to other parts of the watershed like Saddle Mountain and Taylor Mountain to get a different perspective on where the water in the Laguna comes from. So please just add yourself to our e-newsletter and stay tuned for more in-person outings and botany focused programs in the future. We certainly plan to have more. We are just slowly, slowly getting back to some very small in-person programs, which is wonderful news. And we hope to have more coming next spring. All right, everybody, Caprice, thank you so much. Thank you to all of you for being here. Have a wonderful afternoon and we will send you a huge follow-up email probably early tomorrow morning. So check that out. That should come to you through Eventbrite. It will have the recording and many of the resources we just listed, including the coloring book link, we'll find it. I love that idea too. So we'll include it in there. Um, thanks everybody. See you next time. Bye.